Now, these students have read one hadith each from the last portion of Sahih al-Bukhari. The method of our mashayikh, of my teachers, was that at this occasion, they would give a brief explanation of the final hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and then give some advices, give some general advices for those who have come. Our commemorations of events and our graduations are not filled with a lot of fanfare and a lot of noise and bells and whistles. In fact, what starts off as a majlis of ilm also needs to be completed as a majlis of ilm. So consider yourselves fortunate to be able to sit in one of the classes of these students because essentially this is what this is. The last chapter of Sahih al-Bukhari is called Kitab al-Tawheed, the book of Tawheed. And in some copies of Sahih al-Bukhari, rebuttal of various deviant groups such as the Jahmiyyah. Jahmiyyah were a group founded by a man by the name of Jahm ibn Safwan. This man spread many incorrect beliefs amongst the Muslims and polluted their, their creed and skewed their understanding of what Allah was. Up till this time, Muslims had been reading and listening to what was in the Quran and listening to what was said by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and through these two things they were gaining an understanding of who Allah is as Islam spread around the world and the Muslims conquered the Byzantine Empire, the Persian Empire so these people had libraries with books of their philosophers. With the passage of time, many of these books were translated, translated into the Arabic language and Muslims started reading them. As they started reading them, they started trying to view their religion from the lens of those philosophers from a lens that was not spiritual it was not revolving around divine revelation can you just adjust it? it's still too much it's too strong just tone it down a little So instead of turning to divine revelation to recognize who Allah was and what their beliefs were going to be, they started turning to these philosophical and logical formulas to try to decode, decipher, and figure out what Allah was all about. And their own reasoning became the basis of what would form their beliefs. The exact opposite. Muslims all along, all this time, Muslims had been saying Sami'na wa ata'na. They had been reading the Quran and recognizing Allah through the Quran. These people introduced their own way of doing that. So they started putting limitations on what could be an attribute of Allah. Even if Allah said He was doing something, they said, no, we have reservations. Even if Allah described Himself with an attribute, for example, Allah said, I hear, they said, no, Allah can't hear. If Allah says, I see, they said, no, Allah doesn't see. If Allah said, I have a hand, they said, no, Allah can't have a hand. They started putting their own limitations and restrictions on who Allah was and what Allah was. So imagine the damage that occurred. Groups like the Mu'tazila emerged. And Mu'tazil means someone who has separated themselves, isolated themselves. These people had their own sets of beliefs. Today, you might not hear these people re being referred to as groups, as sects. No one really talks about the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila. 
in communities today, but those beliefs exist even today. Even though the label isn't there, those beliefs exist even today. You have people trying to give self-styled explanations about who Allah is and how Allah is. So the objective of Imam Bukhari is to refute those arguments and refute those statements by exposing to the world what Allah and His Rasul have said about those attributes of Allah which these people have challenged. One of the famous issues that they brought up is that the Qur'an is a makhluk of Allah. Out of nowhere, there was no need to discuss this issue, Sahaba never discussed it. All of a sudden they came out with this, with this new thing that guess what? I bet you didn't know that the Qur'an is also a creation from the creations of Allah. Now this was a baseless thing. And sometimes these types of groups get support from, from different areas. In this case, these people started getting the support of the Abbasi Khulafa, like Mahmoud al-Rashid, who deem these beliefs to be the official beliefs of the kingdom, of the Muslim world. And then people like Imam Ahmad ibn Hamil rahimahullah stood up and challenged challenged these beliefs and challenged those people who had seated themselves in positions of authority and denounced what they were saying. And they stood like pillars and mountains until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately gave victory to the correct beliefs and those who upheld them. This last sub-chapter is related to that. Babu Qawlillahi, the chapter of Allah Azza wa Jal statement, And we will place the scales of justice on the Day of Judgment. Al-Mawazin is plural of Mizan, which means scale. Al-Qist, it means justice, fairness, and it is also used to describe someone or something that is just. And this is one of those Arabic words that does not change forms from singular to dual to plural. It stays al-qist, irrespective of what it is describing. So this is an ayah from the Qur'an. This is a portion of an ayah from the Qur'an. وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ الْيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا وَإِنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ In Surah Al-Anbiya, we will bring the scales of justice on the Day of Judgment. And even the smallest deed, a deed as insignificant or as small as a mustard seed, if it was committed in this world, it will be brought and presented and placed on those scales on the Day of Judgment because No one is going to be wronged even in the least. Like the Quran says Every speck of good or bad will be made apparent on that day. The Quran talks about this Mizan in different places. That the weight of deeds on that day, it is true, it is haq. Those whose scales are heavy will succeed and those whose scales are light will fail. So the Quran makes reference to these scales. Now what, does, what do these scales have to do with this, with this topic? First thing is that the Mu'tazila denied the existence of these scales. They said that there's no actual scales out there, but rather there is a system of justice that Allah has and somehow everything is going to work out. There's no actual scales, but there is some kind of a system of justice that will take place and based on that, decisions and judgments will be passed about people. So he's refuting that. Allah Manwar Shah Kashmiri Rahmatullahi says that here Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi is refuting those people who said that the Quran is a makhluk of Allah. Because 
all if it's makhluk if it's a makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it is subject to being weighed and measured and is there anyone who can try to weigh and measure the, the book of Allah in the scale of Allah on the day of judgment they cannot so وَأَنَّ أَعْمَالَ بَنِي آدَمْ All the deeds of Bani Adam وَقَوْلَهُمْ And all the statements of Bani Adam Every single one of them is going to be placed into this scale to be weighed Everything is going to be weighed Now there is a difference between weighing and counting It doesn't say that the deeds are going to be counted A scale is not something for counting, it's something for weighing what that means is, while quantity always attributes to weight, it may not equal the weight. It, it will take a lot more feathers to have a ton than it will take bricks to make a ton. So the flat feathers will be plenty, but every one of them will be so light that it will take so many of them to have weight. And a brick, well, every single one of them will have weight. Similarly, it is possible that a person has many, 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 many good deeds, but they have no weight in the sight of Allah. Why wouldn't they have weight? It could be that there wasn't enough sincerity in those deeds. They were being done for the wrong reason. Allah says, فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا No weight for those deeds. It could be that they were doing the deeds in the wrong way. They were making efforts, they were doing deeds, but their deeds were going, taking them in the wrong direction. Some people will stand on the Day of Judgment tired, exhausted. Even after all of that exhaustion, they will have to end up going to Jahannam because the effort that they made was on the wrong things. Similarly, it could be that a person has very few sins. But the sins are so heavy that they outweigh all their good deeds. Like the hadith mentions that sometimes a person says one phrase, one sentence. In the Abdullah person says one sentence, one statement that displeases Allah. The person is not even taking it seriously themselves. But yaktubullahu biha sakhatahu ila yawmi yalqah. That one word was so terrible in the sight of Allah, Allah puts a seal of anger on this person until the day of judgment. Allah says, I will be angry with you until the day I see you. Do whatever you want. And in one hadith is mentioned that sometimes because of one word, meaning one statement, a person's fall, a person falls into Jahannam, the distance between the sky and the earth. So good deeds, and sometimes there's one good deed that is so powerful, as we will see. One good deed outweighs all a person's bad deeds. So deeds are going to be weighed, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ensured that there is justice in those scales. Al-Mawazin al qist no one is going to be wronged on that, on that day. Everyone will get what they deserve. Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi quotes Imam Mujahid ibn Jabr, famous Tabiri, student of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He spent a great deal of time with him, lived with him in Mecca. Al Qustas, Al Adal, the word Qustas, which is also in some of the Qiraat, like the Riwayat of Hafs, it's Qistas. Where the Quran says, Wazilu bil qistas al mustaqim. Shaykh al Islam is telling his people that he's telling them to stop the corruption, he's telling them to stop dealing unfairly. He's saying, when you weigh and when you measure, do it with a straight balance. Use a straight scale, a balanced scale. He says this word, it's also used in the Roman language in the meaning of justice. Imam Bukhari, why is Imam Bukhari mentioning this? One of the habits of Imam Bukhari Abdullah throughout this whole book is he likes explaining difficult words. 
And any word that is in the Quran or a word similar to it is in the Quran, Imam Bukhari Abdullah will always explain the word. Even if the word is being used in hadith, but it's also referenced in the Quran, he will explain the meaning of that. So here he's just doing that. It's as per his habit. He's been doing this throughout the whole book. There's a difference in, in the usage of this word depending on which form you use it in. If you use qist as a verb or as a noun, as a derived noun like qasit, well, it gives the opposite meaning of qist. It means somebody who is zalim, somebody who is unjust. And if you use it in ruba'i form or thalati mazid fi as somebody, some would, some would call it, in, from Bab Ifal, and you say Muqsit, Muqsit means someone who does justice. Students sitting in front of me know what I'm talking about. Some of you might be lost, but it's okay, just bear with us. Then Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi brings this hadith from his teacher Ahmad ibn Ishkab. Ahmad ibn Ishkab, Rahimahullah, is a Kufi Rawi. Now I'm going to just very little skimming through some of the details of these, of these narrators because hadith has two portions. Every hadith has two portions, both of which need to be studied. The first portion is the sanad. Those are the people who narrated that, who took it from someone, who took it from someone, who took it from someone, who took it from, someone, took it from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So studying those people, this is the first part of the study of hadith. The second part are the wordings of hadith. What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? So the first is, who brought this to us? Studying the Sanad answers this question. Who conveyed this to us? So Imam Bukhari is telling you who conveyed it to him. So, Ahmad ibn Ishkab, he's a Kufi Rawi. He is, in fact, Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi from all the the Rijal of Siha, Imam Bukhari is the only one who has taken a hadith from him. He's the only one who had a chance to meet him. He passed away in the year 217 after Hijrah. He is agreed upon as a very sound and authentic narrator. And he had many, many a hadith. Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi says, The last time I met him was in Egypt. Because he had, tried, he had shifted from Ufa to Egypt. He remained there, he passed away there. Imam Bukhari says, my last meeting with him was in 217 after Hijrah. Ahmad ibn Ishkab takes this hadith from Muhammad ibn Fudayl. Muhammad ibn Fudayl is also a Kufi Rawi. And he is in the level of those who, who saw the Tabi'is. He's not a Tabi'i himself. But he saw some of the Tabi'is. His narrations are found in Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, the Nasai, Ibn Majah, all these books. And he is also a very strong narrator. Imam al Dhahabi Rahmatullahi calls him Al Imam Al Saduq Al Hafiz. He was an Imam of his time, extremely diligent in narrating hadith. And he was a hafid, which means he had memorized, he had committed to memory thousands and thousands of ahadith. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi is one of his students. He takes this hadith from his teacher, Umara ibn al Qarqar. Umara is also a Kufi Rawi. So all the narrators in this hadith are Kufis, people of Kufa of Iraq. Interesting thing about Umara is he had an uncle who might be more famous than he is, Abdullah ibn Shubruma. Abdullah ibn Shubruma, Shubruma was his uncle, his father's, his father's brother. Interesting thing was he was older than his uncle, as is, as is what happens sometimes. And, and Muhaddithin have said he was actually more knowledgeable than his uncle. But Abdullah ibn Shubrama's name is mentioned, Ibn Shubrama's name is mentioned amongst the great fuqaha of the Ummah. But his uncle also came to him, came to Umara, his nephew, and took a hadith from him. He became his student. Khair. 
He is also from the Atba'u Tabi'een. He has spent time with the Tabi'is, though he is not one of them. He takes this hadith from his teacher Abu Zur'ah. Now, there are three Abu Zur'ahs, three famous Abu Zur'ahs that come in hadith. So you need to identify who is who, and the easiest way to do it is look at their tabaqa, look at when they were. There's Abu Zur'ah al-Razi, the most famous one. There's Abu Zur'ah al-Dimashqi, the second most famous one. The third most famous one actually is the most senior of them, even though he's less known. So this Abu Zur'ah is al-Bajali, and he is the direct descendant, he is the direct grandson of Jalil ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, the great Sahabi of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jalil ibn Abdullah al-Bajali was one of the most handsome Sahaba. He was one of the most good-looking and well-built Sahaba. And there are many stories about him with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with other Sahaba, many incidents about his akhlaq, his wisdom, his cleverness. So he had a son named Amr, and Amr had a son named Harim. And Abu Zura'a's name was actually Harim, Abu Zura'a is the kunya. So he is a tabi'i. And he has taken from his, his grandfather, he has narrated a hadith directly from him, as well as from many sahaba. In this particular narration, he takes the hadith from Sayyidul Muhaddithin min al sahaba Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is narrating from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he alayhi salatu wa sallam said kalimatan there are two kalimas in other words two phrases a kalima can refer to a word a single word and it can refer to a group of words so there are two phrases now the description of them is, is, is significant, so we pay attention to the description. The first thing about them is they are habibatan. They are beloved. Habib in the meaning of mahbub. They are beloved to whom? To ar-Rahman. They are beloved to ar-Rahman. Muhaddithin say that Nabi Wasallam could have used any of the attributes of Allah. He could have said habibatan ila Allah. But he used ar-Rahman here to indicate that what is about to be told is from the vastness of Allah's mercy is from the vast rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are mahbub towards ar-rahman khafifatani ala lisan in terms of amal in terms of the slave how are they they are very light on the tongue, very easy on the tongue. Simple to pronounce, simple to recite, and easy to recite in great numbers, easy to recite profusely. What else? The third thing that's mentioned is what does a person get for saying them? First is, what is the status of those kalimat? Says they are habibatan ila rahman. How do we practice them? It's very easy. The practice is going to be easy. What will I get? Fatilatani fil mizan. They are extremely heavy in the scale of deeds. That's how he aligns this hadith with the heading of the subchapter, Nada al Mawazin. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places those mawazin, those scales, then the responsibility of the slave is going to be to fill that scale and to make it as heavy as possible. So this is one of those things that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us that will make the scale very, very heavy. فَقِيلَتَانِ فِي الْمِيزَانِ What is it that is so heavy in the scale, so easy to do and so beloved to Allah? These two words or these two phrases, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanallah al -Azim. I will explain the meaning of this in just a minute. I want to backtrack. This Mizan has been mentioned and described in ahadith, in numerous ahadith. In one riwayah, a person came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I have some slaves. I have two slaves. 
and they don't listen to me, they hurt me, they abuse me, I'm always doing good things and I am now fed up with them. I, I don't know what to do. So what will be my dealing with them? How will this be judged on the Day of Judgment? So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, here's what's going to happen. Whatever they have done to hurt you, they've betrayed you, they haven't taken amana, maybe they've stolen from you, whatever they've done to hurt you, it's all going to be put together. And if you have punished them, that is also going to be put onto the scale. And whatever you have punished them is going to be minused. It's going to be minus from their deeds because they have already been punished for those deeds. Then it will be seen that is there still misbehavior on their part that's left over? Or is there punishment that's exceeding what they did? If there is misbehavior left over, which was more than the punishment, well then they may still be punished. But if the punishment has already covered all of the misbehavior and there is excessive punishment, then you will be taken to task. So this man panicked. He said, Oh Prophet Allah, what am I going to do? How is this? He said, didn't you read the Qur'an? And Nabi Sallallahu recited these verses. So he said, I think there's only one solution for me. And that is, I free these slaves for the sake of Allah. This hadith is in Tirmidhi from Aisha radiallahu anha. In another hadith, famous hadith of Tirmidhi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will be dealing with the accounts, with the hisab of one person. And his books, his book of deeds is going to be brought and his book of misdeeds is going to be in some 99 folders or 99 files. He will have so many sins. 99 files and these will be brought and they will be put into the scale of this into the pan of this scale and there will be nothing on the other side so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him that whatever is in these files is it true have my angels done any wrong to you have they exaggerated anything is there anything in there that you haven't actually done he will say no Everything is documented exactly as it happened. Allah SWT will ask the angels, is there any good deed? Is there any good deed of this person? So the angels will come back with a small slip of paper. Now one narration of Ahmad mentions that that little slip of paper will be like the size of your nail. The size of your fingernail. Small, tiny slip of paper. And on that little slip of paper will be the kalima La ilaha illallah. In the narration of Mustan Ahmad, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. The kalima of shahada. Now he is going to be thinking that this little tiny speck of paper, what is it going to do for me in front of 99 files and folders of misdeeds? But the moment the angels put that little speck of paper into the pan of the scale, it will drop so fast and so hard that those 99 folders of deeds will go flying into the air. And Nabi Sallallahu says, فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَثْقُلُ مَعَ اللَّهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing can be heavier, nothing can be heavier than the name of Allah. That hadith is also in Tirmidhi. In one narration of Bazaar, it's mentioned that when a person passes at the scale, then angels will announce that, oh people, so and so has now passed Sa'ida Sa'adatan la yashqa ba'daha abada. This person has succeeded permanently, there's no failure for this person after now. And someone who fails at the mizan, at the scale of deeds, it will be announced that so and so, shaqiya shaqawatan la yas'adu ba'daha abada. This person has failed, they are never going to succeed. How does the scale become heavy with good deeds? 
Well, one deed is mentioned right here in this hadith that we're discussing in Sahih al-Bukhari. But in the other hadith of Tirmidhi, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that the heaviest thing to be placed in the scale of a person's deeds on the Day of Judgment is al-khuluqul hasan, good akhlaq. There is nothing heavier than good akhlaq to weigh down the scales of good deeds. Heaviest thing. And some narrations, though they're not very strong, they mention that a person who is engaged in helping people out, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will come to the scale when his deeds are being weighed and he will do shafa'a for that person as the scales are being weighed. Allama ibn Abdul Bar Rahimahullah has mentioned in one narration in his book Jami'u Bayan al-Ilmi wa Fadli that a person will come to have his deeds weighed and his scale of good deeds is going to be light. He's going to panic. Then someone is going to come and put these something that's in the shape of these massive clouds. These massive clouds will be taken and placed into the scale of good deeds and all of a sudden that side of the scale will drop. He will be bewildered that what just happened here? I didn't have deeds. What was this that was placed? So he will be told, this is the knowledge that you taught to other people. It has come to your rescue. So there are different things Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us and we find in the Athar of Sahaba and Tabi'is that will weigh down a person's scale of good deeds on the Day of Judgment. So Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi is directing us to all of those things. Now someone might ask a question that how are deeds going to be weighed? Because in that riwayah of the slip of paper, it's called the Hadith of Bitaqa, it's mentioned that the paper is going to be placed and the books themselves will be placed. And this is the view of some ulama and some ayimma that it's the books of deeds that will be weighed. That is what will be placed and based on that, decisions will be made. Other ulama have said like Allah ibn Kathir, Allama Qurtubi is of the view, of the first view, people like Ibn Kathir are of another view. He says, look, there are many ahadith that talk about a'mal taking shape. A'mal being given some form of, some physical form on the Day of Judgment. Like Surah Baqarah is going to come in the form of flocks of birds. Surah Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. They will come in the form of flocks of birds or in the form of clouds. Quran and Siyam will come to a person's rescue in the form of people. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people teased Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu because his legs were very thin, his, his calves, his shins were very thin. The people made fun of him. He said, don't make fun of him. Wallahi, those thin calves are heavier in the sight of Allah than Mount Uhud. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talks about the weight of deeds, talks about qirat. He talks about the weights of deeds. So they say that it's not difficult for Allah to weigh the deeds themselves. Allah ibn Kathir is of the view that all of these things can be weighed. A person can be weighed. Their deeds can be weighed. And their books of deeds can also be weighed. The point is that these scales are haq. وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَ إِذِنِ الْحَقْ And we will have our deeds weighed one way or the other. That's what you and I are responsible for. Imam Bukhari has narrated this same hadith at a few other places in his Sahih. Not with the same Sanad. This Sanad had Ahmad ibn Ishqab from Muhammad ibn Fudayl. At another place in Kitab al-Ta'awat he takes it from Zuhair ibn Harb from Muhammad ibn Fudayl. At another place he take it, takes it from Qutaybah ibn Sa'id. Imam Muslim has also taken this hadith. His sanad ends up with Muhammad ibn Fudayl. Imam Tirmidhi also has taken this hadith from his teachers. That sanad also ends up with Muhammad ibn Fudayl. Now, coming back to, back to this word, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al So the first thing we should know 
is that these words are mentioned or this kalima is mentioned in many ahadith. In fact, Aisha radiallahu anha asked Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Prophet of Allah, I hear you very frequently saying Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al-Azim, Astaghfirullah. He said, this is what my Lord has commanded me to do. After Surah Ida Ja'a Nasrullah wal Fatih was revealed, these were some of the kalimat that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reciting very frequently. In fact, Ibn Kathir has mentioned one narration that says, towards the end of his blessed life, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not sit or stand or come or go without reading this kalima, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al Azim. Rabi'at ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu, who was one of the Sahaba who did khidmat of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, that after I used to complete whatever I needed to do for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would sit outside his door in case he needed me and he would call me. And he said, I would hear him until late into the night saying, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al -Azim. This was the dhikr of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sahih ahadith mentioned that this is the dhikr of the malaika. And through this, through this dhikr, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives them their sustenance. And there are many other ahadith. Not all of them are strong. In fact, most of them are da'if. That a person came and complained about debts and complained about you know, problems with their risk and so on. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him to read this. And there are different wordings that are narrated. One is Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al -Azim. Another is Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al -Azim wa bihamdi astaghfirullah. Another one is Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al -Azim wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. These different wordings have come in different riwayat. And the Prophet Sallallahu has in Sahih Ahadith instructed people to read this at least 100 times every morning. So this much is established through Sahih Ahadith. This is something Nabi Sallallahu read profusely. This is something he has instructed the Ummah to do. He encouraged the Ummah to do it at least 100 times. And this is something that the Malaika also recite. And through this risk is provided. This much is authenticated. And in this particular Hadith, he is saying that this is something very heavy in the Mizan. What does it mean? What does Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanallah al Adim actually mean? Subhanallah, Subhan means tanzih. That I, I pronounce the pureness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all flaws and defects. I extol Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is beyond any flaw, fault, defect, mistake, or any kind of weakness. It's called this, doing this, saying this, feeling this, this is called tanzeeh, where you remove all negative things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing ne negative is attributed to Allah azza wa jal. That's what subhanallah means. And also when we say subhanallah, this is, this one phrase, it gathers all of those sifat which are called the sifat salbiya. All of those things that put Allah azza wa jal beyond limits, that put Him beyond, uh, beyond limitations. All of those things that bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above and beyond, transcend, transcending beyond all His makhluqat, Subhanallah summarizes every single one of them. Wa bihamdihi, this wow, this wow is for inclusion. It means I glorify Allah while I also praise Him. I don't just glorify Allah and say Allah is pure, Allah is glorified. No, that was removing all negative things from Allah. Wa bihamdihi means I affirm that all praise is for Allah. All good things are attributed, attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All khair is attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So subhanallah wa bihamdihi, I glorify Allah and I praise Him. I do both things at the same time. Then the next phrase, subhanallah al -Azim. I glorify Allah who is the great, the majestic. Now if you look at this, two things in this are repeated and one element of this 
is used only once. Subhan is repeated twice. Allah is repeated twice. Hamd is mentioned only once. The Sharab Hadith, Rahimahumullah, Allama Kirmani, Rahmatullah, and others have derived something very powerful from this. He said, it's easy to praise Allah. He said, Alhamdulillah. But when shaitan plays with a person as they're going through difficulties of life, shaitan starts trying to bring the mind towards blaming Allah somehow or another. That somehow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is to blame for this. Or somehow, billah, there is some kind of a defect in Allah's planning for me. There is something wrong. Why did Allah test me in this way? Why did Allah put me in this situation? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring that upon me? So it is necessary to remove those thoughts and those wrong beliefs. That's why it's done twice. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanallahi al-azim. The first time I negate everything negative from him and I attribute all praise and all good to him. And the second time, again, I glorify him because he is too great to have any flaws. He is al azim He is the great, the majestic, and his greatness is so high and it is so powerful that it leaves no room for imperfections. So when a person says this from the bottom of their heart, it opens up the doors of the mercy of Allah. Muhaddithin have mentioned that when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Karimatani Habibatan, these two words are beloved, they're saying it's not just the words that are beloved, the one who says these becomes the beloved of Allah. So in this, Nabi Wasallam has shown us the path of mahabba of Allah. Through saying these words and through believing and thinking about what we are saying. Now Imam Bukhari Abdullah closes his book, concludes his book with this hadith. Why? First thing is that he started his book with the hadith of Niyyah. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ He started his book with the hadith of Niyyah and the first chapter was related to divine revelation. Some muhaddithin have mentioned that Imam Bukhari Ramadullah wants to tell us that the first thing that is important for any good to happen and before a person can benefit from this divine revelation is that their intention must be clear. They need to clear their intention from any ulterior motives. Once their motive has been clear, clarified, then they can approach wahi. And once they approach wahi, it will open up to them all the doors of understanding that they will require for the rest of their lives. It is through that that they will get everything. And towards the end, he says, look, you've gone through wahi. Oh, students of Sahih al-Bukhari, you've gone through this whole book. What amal are you going to prepare now? How are you going to make your scale of deeds heavy? Think of this before you close your book. Because at the end, there will be no one and nothing that can help us. It will be us. مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا وَيُكَلِّمُهُ رَبُّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ تَرْجُمَانٍ Allah will speak to every single person directly without the means of an interpreter. And at that time, فَيَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ أَيْمَنَ مِنْهُ A person who will, they will squirm, they will panic, they will look to the right, can I escape? Anywhere to the right side. فَلَا يَرَىٰ إِلَّا مَا قَدَّمْ Nothing but heaps and piles of his own deeds. وَيَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ أَشْأَمَ مِنْهُ In his panic, he will turn to the left. فَلَا يَرَىٰ إِلَّا مَا قَدَّمْ There also is nothing but his own deeds. وَيَنْظُرُ تِلْقَاءَ وَجْهِ فَلَا يَرَىٰ إِلَّا النَّارِ and then he will see if I can escape by going that way and in front of him and there will be nothing but the fire of Jahannam. فَاتَّقُ النَّارُ وَلَوْ بِشِقِّ تَمْرَةِ Save yourself from that fire even if it is by giving half of a date in Sadaqah today. So all of us have to, be, have to reach there. If we have gone through all of this ilm, these thousands of narrations, 
But we don't have that day in front of us and we're fooling ourselves, we're deceiving ourselves. Because nothing will matter at that time. So this is the lesson that Imam Bukhari Ramadul Ali wants to give us. That's one of the lessons. Second lesson. To bring pure intentions into our hearts, pure knowledge of wahi into our minds, and the dhikr of Allah on our tongues, this is the khulasa of this theme. This is the summary of Islam, this is the summary of hadith, and this is the summary of what this book has been written for. Third lesson, Imam Bukhari wanted to complete this book with those words that are most beloved to Allah. So he said, what could be more beloved to Allah than what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said is beloved to Allah. I am not going to write a conclusion of this book. I am simply going to write those words that I know Allah already loves. So he mentions this hadith and the last words are those words, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanallah ali. So this is the conclusion of this dars. We are short on time, otherwise I would have gone into the details of how I narrate Sahih al-Bukhari, with which Sanad I am narrating Bukhari to these students, which teachers I have taken from, who they took from, and what is my Sanad to Imam Bukhari. But our time is short, so we'll leave that maybe some other time if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows, we will do that.